Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of Town Council. I'm Christine Horner, the town's water quality engineer. Uh, thank you all so much for having me here this evening uh, for a quick presentation on stormwater management and regulations within the town. So like I said, I've uh, prepared this uh, presentation starting with uh, a basic overview of the stormwater system, um, some challenges that we face. Um, as well as the legislation and the requirements that are triggered, um, and then uh, following up with some solutions. But I'm happy to take questions as we go. I'm flexible with it. So if there's anything you need more detail, detail in, just feel free to interrupt me. So starting with the basics of, um, as you all know, what is storm water? Um, it's pretty much any water that flows uh, over, the, over the ground after a rain, or in the case of this evening, a snow event. Um, and with it, it goes untreated uh, to our streams and our local waterways and carries any of the pollutants that are on the ground, such as dirt, uh, sediment, chemicals, uh, with it to our streams. So the town has about 1,800 curb inlets, which are what uh, is pictured in the bottom left-hand side there. You'll see them on our roads and in our parking lots as well. Um, and those 1,800 curb inlets flow flow to about 45 miles of pipe within the town. Um, those pipes actually discharge to about five miles of stream. And then you'll see on the right a map, um, and that map is of the town's watersheds. We're split about 50-50 in town with the north half going to Difficult Run and the south half going to Akatink Creek. Both of those actually flow to the Potomac River. So here is an aerial image showing how Vienna, like many of the jurisdictions around us, have developed over the past 80 years. What you'll see here is an increase in impervious surface that has come along with development. And one of the challenges is, um, until recently, not much attention was paid to stormwater infrastructure or stormwater management within town. So the red circle, for perspective, is the location of the community center. So with that development, like I said, there is an increase in impervious surface, and that does a lot to the natural um, cycle of water. So on the top left, you'll see natural ground cover. And in that state, um, which is forested, uh, undeveloped land, a lot of the water infiltrates into the ground. And then what doesn't infiltrate actually goes back up into the atmosphere through the trees and the vegetation. In that scenario, very little water runs off of the surface. So as we develop, you'll see on the bottom two images, a change happens. So less water actually goes into the ground and the majority of the water flows off into what we call runoff. So less infiltration, more runoff. Um, and when that water runs off, it carries with it any of the pollutants on the surface. The three main pollutants that we regulate in town are phosphorus, nitrogen, and sediment. Sources of those are yard fertilizers, yard waste, construction sites, um, and other pollutants like chemicals and uh, anything that gets spilled on the ground. So not only does that water carry with it the pollutants, it also enters our streams in a much greater uh, volume as well as velocity. So those photos are uh, common examples of erosion in streams in town. You'll see evidence of trees being undermined as well as blockages. Um, and flooding that occurs because of these uh, impervious surfaces. And then in addition to that, we have water quality and ecosystem impacts. Uh, when sediment is released from the banks, phosphorus also um, enters the water um, and there is degraded habitat. Yes, please. So if, can I ask you to go back sure. one slide? Uh, one more. Yeah, this one. So basically, the greater the impermeable, the less the water is going through to deep filtration or shallow filtration and the more to run off. I presume one reason that that's a potentially bad thing is because the shallow and the deep filtration act as kind of a natural filter to some of the chemicals. Yes, that is correct. The infiltration filter the chemicals and it also right. removes the volume. So by Oh, that's right. The volume, <laughs> it slows it down because ultimately the shallow goes to the streams as well, but it's just slower and cleaner. 
Yes. And it actually, because you're correct, when it infiltrates, it does end up as what we call base flow in streams. Right. So when you have uh, very little infiltration, the base flow drops because the water can't get into the stream that way. It actually goes over land, which is much quicker. Right. Okay. Thanks. I just wanted Absolutely. to sort of see if my understanding was correct. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a fast talker, so feel free to slow me down if you need to. I apologize for that. Ask a question. Yeah, Ed, hey, uh, Ray is asking a question, and then you can you can go next. I don't have a question. I just really like this chart. <laughs> I, I cannot take credit for making it, but I find it to be very helpful. I, I, it's very, very helpful. Yeah. Go ahead and take credit. <laughs> it's me. We, we like this one. Uh, Ed, Ed, did you want to ask a question? Can you go to the next one? Because I... Next slide, I had a question. I'm hearing Ed too. Christine, if I, if I understood what you said correctly, you said we regulate these in the town. How do we regulate like yard for, did I, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly and can you explain how this goes? Okay. I walked away. So the question okay. that I believe I heard was how do we regulate uh, these pollutants? Linda texted. I'm getting a bunch of background. Are you there? On the way. I like Melanie. What <laughs> is So, my question was I, I think I heard you said we regulate these sources. And, like, yard fertilizer, do, does the town regulate it, or did I misunderstand what you said? Sure. To, to clarify, we regulate the pollutants like phosphorus and nitrogen and sediment. Um, and we do that through water quality controls. We don't necessarily regulate the application of fertilizer, although we do um, give out best practices on how to pro appropriately use fertilizer. So we track the pollutants um, through water quality improvements and development, but we don't necessarily regulate how they get onto the surface. But my follow-up question is then you say we regulate the end use, but if a uh... If everybody in the town starts using five times more yard fertilizer, there's really nothing mm -hmm. we can do about that. We're just now responsible to take more of that out of the end pipes, or could you explain that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Um, so we regulate the development when it comes to these pollutants and the associated increase of these pollutants in terms of development. We do not regulate the quantities that homeowners put on their yards. So these pollutants get into the, um, the streams and the waterways through a change of an impervious cover too, um, which is how we regulate them in terms of development by watching that change in impervious cover. The day-to-day -day, um, use of fertilizer um, and other things that also lead to these pollutants in our watershed are not regulated. Thank you very much. Clarifies. Very helpful. So I believe we left off with the. Oh. Looks like you got a hand. I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying to. I'm sorry. I was working on the on the. Okay. Sorry. 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 Um, who who is raising their hand? Steve, go ahead, Steve. Yeah. yeah. If you could go back to the uh, the pretty one on the urban watershed challenge. Uh, okay. Now. To follow up on uh, what Chuck was asking, if you have less infiltration, do you also have an issue of potential sinkholes in the future? So typically this, what we call the sinkholes that we find are related to more infrastructure. If there is a, you know, an aging pipe with a crack in it, the sediment will go through that. Um, less infiltration, I wouldn't say necessarily leads to more sinkholes in the in our infrastructure. No. Okay, and the, re the reason I ask is it, it, if we look at the end of uh, Roland and Nutley, um, you'll mm -hmm. see that there's been some, within the past few years, there's been some recent uh, patchwork that's been done, which is substantial. And it's substantial because what had been done prior to that 
was not substantial and it was being washed out basically not by leaking pipes but more like under we had streams that were that followed really followed nut life uh, underground streams so i'm just wondering if there's less infiltration if that impacts the below ground water levels that could lead to potential problems in the future that, that's where i was going with it I Okay, I, I understand your question now. And the less the change in the infiltration rate will change the flow of groundwater and any potential items below the surface. Um, but the bigger effect that we typically see is the increase, the impacts of the increased runoff on erosion on the surface. So our urban watershed challenge leads us into the legislation because we are not the only jurisdiction with these types of concerns. So there's been a lot of legislation created to help uh, remediate um, and regulate stormwater. Um, starting at the federal level, level, we have the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, um, and they regulate through the Clean Water Act um, in the 70s, which really set the groundwork for the state level which is um, the Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ, which utilizes the state water control law. Um, and more, the one with the biggest impact on the town is the Stormwater Management Act. So the Stormwater Management Act actually gives the town at a local level, the um, ability to discharge from our runoff into the streams. So it's a permit um, and it's called um, the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Permit, commonly referred to as an MS4 permit. So that allows us to discharge under the state regulations. Um, also, we have the, storm, the Virginia Stormwater Management Program, um, which was created from the Stormwater Management Act on the state level. Um, and then we implement the act through the program. And we are the authority on that, um, and that is given to us, that authority is given to us from the state. So with that authority, and it's usually called a, a VSMP, Virginia Stormwater Management Program, we have state regulations that we are responsible for enforcing. Um, those regulations became effective in July 2014, and they monitor, sorry, they regulate the quality and quantity of the runoff that occurs on land disturbing activities. Um, and those land disturbing activities are greater than one acre. Um, and they also state within the act that our local ordinance needs to be consistent with the act and the regulations. Just a very, very helpful. Just a quick question. You give a permit. Do you ever do follow up to see if they're if it's exactly as you hoped it would be? So we issue permits for land disturbance, and yes, we do inspections on those permits. How often? Um, it happens, I believe, after a major rain event. Um, so I believe it's half an inch of rain, and then I think it's every. I could check the the law, but I believe it's every ten days for erosion and sediment control, that is. Okay. So we are also, and as Vienna, and we're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, so we have additional regulations that we need to comply with. So the biggest difference here is the Chesapeake Bay regulations say that a land disturbing activity is anything greater than 2,500 square feet, so 50 by 50. Um, and the Chesapeake Bay regulations also say that as a local jurisdiction, we may regulate single family residential construction. So just, I remember um, when I was on the planning commission, I believe in like 12 or 13, there was a major court case that came down that forced Virginia to comply with the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act. And I think this legislation sort of was born from that court case, which gave us a lot more authority and obligation and accountability than we had in the past with respect to total um, stormwater runoff as opposed to new stormwater runoff. And this, this was a, like a big change. And you might wanna 
sort of explain how that happened and what that means because it's it it, it was a sea change in what we could regulate here in town when that happened. For better or worse, we're now in charge of reducing stormwater management, is my understanding, to comply with the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, whereas before this court case, we really weren't. Yeah, so the stormwater regulations in 2014 had a dramatic change, and particularly how we review them for engineering and the requirements on site. So what we look for um, is in the pre-2014 was really just a a quick comparison of you know pre what we call pre versus yeah. post, um, and with those types of engineering techniques, you end up with a lot of just underground storage detention. So we have a lot of those throughout town, um, big pipes with little control structures, which do a lot for flooding, which was the main concern you know pre 2014. Um, but now there are concerns with you know uh, water quality as well. So that's how we ended up with a lot of these um, smaller. Uh, practices throughout town, the rain gardens, and the so it was a big um, it was a big shift in stormwater legislation that took the industry a while to all understand, and it's uh, kind of get everybody on the same page with it. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, please. Um, this uh, this under twenty five hundred feet. This gives us the uh, the teeth to regulate. If I buy a lot and build a house on it, I have to to certain storm water regulations. This, this, this gives us the teeth. If you disturb 2,500 um, square feet or more then yes. Which you put, most houses are doing that, okay. That's correct. Can, can I jump next to the um, technical criteria question? Uh, sure, would you like me to change the slide or? Excuse me? Do you want me to change the slide? Was this? No, the... sure. we're there right now. Okay. Purpose cover, and I don't know if this is the uh, place to ask in the presentation, there's always a discussion about driveways. Some jurisdictions said that you can use pavers for driveways to help the runoff. What is, is, is this an option here when you talk about impervious cover? So impervious cover is anything that prevents, in, in terms of stormwater, is anything that prevents the natural infiltration of water into the ground. So um, permeable pavements, if they're not designed per the state's specification, they are not um, considered uh, stormwater best management practice, which means they still count as the impervious surface. But is there technology out there to have pavers that will let the water go through that could be used for driveways, or is that pushing it now? Um, if So the only way it wouldn't be considered the impervious cover was if it were an official best management practice. So even if something changed, so I guess even if something prevented it from infiltrating, then it would still be considered impervious. I think that changed, yeah. Howard. I think that, I, I think it used to be, didn't, didn't, didn't we have that discussion when um, John Seekos was in the other day? Does anybody remember that? Yeah, but and we were talking about the pavers on the driveways. Yeah. Right. Well, that was his opinion. He said, you yeah. can count pavers, but I, I don't know. I know. Mike, I'll have to ask about yeah. But the question is, <laughs> is this Mike, a good time? Mike's ready. <laughs> is, is, can you, one of the things we're talking about zoning is if, if, if the driveways, you could use pavers that would let water through, you wouldn't have to cut, account for lot coverage. I think Mike yeah. knows. <clears throat> so the new regulations has specific um, designs that have to be followed for different types of technologies. Yeah. So premier pavers and premier pavement is on the list. So that can be done. But as Christine mentioned, there's specific design criteria and that has to be what the stormwater management facility is on the lot, um, which I don't think we've had any. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if it's just challenging infiltration wise or if you can't infiltrate the water, then it has to outfall into a pipe. Or, or you know something, so I don't. It, it might be a challenging engineering um, for some lots, um, but once you do have that, then that no longer, at least from a stormwater, when you're calculating your impervious cover, that facility, that permeable pavement, is no longer considered um, impervious cover. It's it's it doesn't know, it's count not counting your impervious lot. cover because right. it's the facility itself. It, so, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, again, I don't know if the question can answer it. And again, I'm not an expert. I, I, well, the, the answer I'm looking for is if we 
could use certain pavers in some areas of lot coverage that might solve some of the lot coverage discussion. Yeah, so impervious cover and lot coverage are kind of two different things. They're not one and the same. So I guess you could, you could write the code such that a permeable driveway does not count as lot coverage if you desire. All right, thanks. Can I ask a question, Madam Mayor? Oh yes, please, Ed. Uh, I need you guys, I need the expert to dumb it down a little bit for me. I'm trying to imagine, I have a driver with pavers, so I'm trying to understand what you're saying about pay. Are you saying like, if you space them out enough, then they count as being impermeable or, can you give us some practical examples of what it means to be impervious or not impervious? Because I can't visualize what you're explaining by best management practices and so on. Okay. Well, sure. Um, yeah, I can take a stab at it and feel free to fill in anything I miss. Um, so the difference is the permeable pavement um, needs to you know, permeable pavement that's also a best management practice has a lot of um, design that goes into it. There are specific layers um, that, uh, that allow the water to infiltrate. Um, and then there are porosity, so void space in those layers, as well as, you know, gravel bed. And then the soil itself needs to support the infiltration through these pavers. So it's not necessarily about the spacing of pavers. It's about the design of how they allow water to go through them. So for example, the um, community center has a form of pervious pavement, which is concrete. And if you look at it, it's, it looks very holy. It looks like a sponge. So the water actually drains right through it into a gravel bed um, and then goes into the soil from there. Um, some houses in town do have best management practice driveways that are permeable pavers. Um, and those often look like a paver driveway, but if you look closely, there is a space between the individual pavers where there's little stones and the water goes through those stones in that gap and is able to infiltrate into the soil. Okay, so just and my last question will be then going back to what we were discussing before. For those people that have done that, that have that special driveway, for example, in town, do they get a credit for their lot coverage or are they just doing it because it's a good thing to do? So they're doing it to meet stormwater management requirements because it's an approved BMP. Um, as for, I'm not sure how that ties to planning and zoning's lot coverage calculations. As of the way our code is written, driveways simply do not or do count towards lot coverage. Yeah. Thank you. So, right. so I think the answer to this, this is one of those areas which we really kind of need to focus on when we're going forward with our zoning rewrite because again, lot coverage is independent from stormwater management completely. Even though obviously one of the main objectives of having limited lot coverage is to control stormwater management, but legally they're separate right now. So even though you might put in an, a permeable driveway to meet stormwater management, say you're redesigning your house and you exceed the 2,500 feet, so you've got to deal with the excess runoff and the way you decide to do it is with um, um, uh, permeable driveway. So that will give you your stormwater management credits, but currently under the code, that's still considered impermeable for lot coverage. That, so Chuck, there's actually a little, there's a little bit of a conflict there. Chuck, that, that's under our, we, kind of we, we can adjust that if we wanted to, right, Chuck? I mean, that's not a legal, you said it's a legal definition, but that's something we've chosen. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, yes. we could we could look well, at that. Yeah, no, that's something we could definitely sort of clean up. Thank mm -hmm. you, Ray. Madam Mayor, just to, uh, um, oh yes, so, um, Ray, do you want to wait till the town attorney? Okay, yes, go ahead, Steve. Really, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in. It, it's it, it's it's a no. little bit more complicated, and, and Council Member Anderson's sort of alluding to that. The, the zoning code requires driveways, and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, to be made out of a permanent material and it specifies concrete or asphalt. 
So you would have to, that's in, that's in uh, chapter 18-134. So to, to modify what you all were talking about to allow impervious, I'm, I'm sorry, pervious paving systems, you'd have to address, you'd have to modify section 134. Uh, and that's why we stopped allowing uh, pervious pavers because they technically violated the town's ordinance. And there's two ways you can do pavers. The best way to do it, a driveway guy will tell you, is you lay concrete and then you put pavers on top because they can support the weight. Or you can lay them in sand, but then they settle. And we had some people to do that early on. Greg Hembry allowed and gave an interpretation that that, that would meet a permanent uh uh, a permanent structure because you know they're concrete pavers right they're brick concrete pavers he, so he said that's fine they don't hold up they sag the, the car weights truck weights come and ruin them so council started seeing them popping up and so greg hembry made the administrator this is probably mid like 205 2005 2006 or so um and uh so greg hembry said no we're not going to allow this anymore and that that was really because council pointed it out that's not what we want and the, and the code's never been modified. So that's that's how we got to where we are today. But the, but the design and the criteria have changed a little bit. The, the, the materials have certainly come a long way. So, but they go hand in hand, the zoning and the design of this pervious and pervious surface for driveways is gonna to have to mesh in the zoning code and in the stormwater management if you wanna do that. But that's I'm confused. Are you saying that the code update we're going through can we address this or do we have to go through another step to address this question somewhere else? No, no, I think if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna address pervious surfaces for parking, you, you do it, you're gonna need to do it in the code. That's what I'm saying. You're gonna need a modification chapter 18. So, so you know, that they can accommodate that with the stormwater management um, provisions that we have, I think, but you, right now you, you using pervious pavers would probably violate the, the zoning code that says you have to have a permanent asphalt or concrete structure for your driveway. Can so. I interrupt? This is Cindy Petkak. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, but please. 18134A does allow for a grid paver su surface. Oh. But Cindy, oh. my point is a grid paver can't, the, the reason council didn't want them is because to do a grid paver, to make them pervious, they're not permanent, and that's why that's why planning and zoning stopped granting permits. So that's why planning and zoning says you're not going to get a credit for uh, uh, impervious surface. Um, we're going to count that as impervious surface on your grid pavers, right, Cindy? Well, I, I think it goes back to what Christina is saying that it's not just about putting pavers down. It's a system. It's a best that's management. Right. And so it is. It's not just a just pavers that you buy from Home Depot. Agreed. It is a system. So totally I totally agree. And, and what was being installed that was just, you know, people were throwing down pavers to, to, to get credits for lot coverage. And our code didn't really address it su sufficiently. And the stormwater, it didn't address the stormwater management issues of the pervious versus impervious surface, which we were already starting to deal with for Ches Bay. Um, so, so there are impervious and pervious paver driveways. Did I, did I totally mess that up or is that true? Some are pervious and some are impervious. It's, I mean, Madam Mayor, it's totally true. A, a lot of, a yeah, lot of okay. the paver systems are put on a bed of concrete first. They right. lay the concrete right. and then they put the pavers on them. It's a look, gotcha. it has nothing yeah. to do, it has right. nothing to do with pervious versus impervious surface. What, what you all are talking about is allowing right. a system of pavers or some other materials that is pervious that would right. also not violate, you know, our, our our requirement for having a certain type of driveway, asphalt or concrete or otherwise in residential zone. Yeah. So I think okay. you tweak that. If you want to do that, then tweak it with your zoning update. Okay. Can um, I ask a question? Ray, okay, Anisha, one second. Ray has been waiting patiently. He he had his hand up earlier, so I'm gonna to go to him and then and then you can speak. just a quick comment and a question. Steve, very, very helpful uh, discussion. For you, uh, Christine, in terms of the pervious pavers, if you have a one half inch rain per hour or a three inch rain per hour, there's a different in terms of runoff. 
That's correct. In other words, when you get, is there a certain level of rain where all of a sudden it just overwhelms the system and it's running off like it's asphalt? Uh, yes, that's correct. These pavers and all BMPs, best management practices, are designed to handle only a certain amount of rain. Um, it's usually those more frequent storm events, which tend to be less in intensity. Um, those larger storm events um, will, the excess rain will just run off of them or through them. Um, and that's, you know, per design, they can only take so much water. Okay. Okay. And then um, Nisha, go ahead. Um, so this is actually, can you hear me? Yes. Hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so this is actually a question for um, Steve Brillia then. Um, so section, you know, we're redoing the zoning code and then you had mentioned section, uh, chapter 18, section 134A. So if we wanted, and this is just more of a um, how-to question. So if we wanted to give, let's say we wanted to give uh, some sort of credit, and I don't know what kind, but just right now, just, just a large um, blanket term, some sort of credit to people to put in um, pervious pavers instead of impermeable pavers into their driveway, then we could modify could, or could we modify the definition of a driveway to include pervious pavers consistent with storm water management systems, or would that lead us to the same issues that they had before where the pavers were not um, stable in the sand and whatnot? Well, do you understand think, my question? I do, I do. And I think you need to do something like that, but to answer, there's two questions there. So the, the answer to the first question is yes, you should modify that to permit those kind of systems, the pervious systems to make it very clear because it talks about permanent and asphalt and concrete. Um, and to me, that almost suggests an impervious surface, uh, but, but you wanna make it clear is what I would say. Then you have the system, which I think the engineers have to, to weigh in on. You know, for, for a residential driveway, it needs to support a certain amount of weight. And the worst thing you want is a driveway after a few years to have the ruts, right? And that's, if it's not engineered properly and can't uh, with, withstand certain loads, then, I mean, do you really want those in your, in your, as driveway materials? And that's a separate engineering design question um, that I think you should spend some time on, the engineers should. And there's, there, there are systems out now. I mean, we put some, obviously, at the community center. Uh, it may be crazy expensive, I don't know, but those are the, if people are willing to do it, and then if they get a certain credit for lot coverage, you can incorporate that. And Steve, we could even, I mean, for, forget about it, even if we didn't give credit for lot coverage, we could expand the definition of driveway to include permeable pavers yes. consistent with stormwater management requirements, I guess, right, um, so that it wouldn't have to just be asphalt or concrete, like you said, but in there, we would also have to put in wording that would somehow indicate that these driveways were stable over time. Just looking at wording here, like what, I mean, cause that's the stuff that we need to figure out. But what, <laughs> well, I know, of that. <laughs> I, I know there is some criteria for, uh, you know, the industry in Virginia, they require for asphalt, for instance, there, there's a different, there's accepted standards for, for, you know, uh, uh, depth for residential use, commercial use, highway use. So there's standards. And I, I imagine that they've come out with standards for these kind of materials and what they're rated for, what kind of activity. And so I think you'd want to make sure that they're at least referenced, some standardized reference that, that, that the uh, um, planning and zoning and DPW, when they're looking at building permit plans, when they see the materials they're going to be using and see if that's an acceptable material for a driveway. Uh, you know, it may, I, I know we've come a long way since it was first started. And, and so I know there's more materials out now than there were maybe 10, 15 years ago. So there might be options that people can use that they get the benefit of the stormwater management. Everybody gets that benefit, not just the, the developer, but, and, and you're right, that's a separate issue of whether you want to do count that for a lot of coverage or not. Yeah. So I think we would need information from planning and zoning and maybe public works um, about, you know, if such a thing exists, if we have, if there are permeable pavers out there that are consistent with stormwater management that are also stable and are not going to 
kind of sink over time. So that's something that we can ask them to look into. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Okay, go ahead, Christine. Okay. <clears throat> Right, so we discussed these two definitions. Uh, land disturbing activity is any man-made changes to a site, like grading or excavation. So those uh, definitions become important when we start looking at the technical criteria that we have to review land disturbing activities for. And the first one is water quality. So uh, that's the pollutants that we were talking about previously. Um, the pollutant that we regulate is the phosphorus, and we do that in terms of pounds per year of phosphorus released from a site using what's called the runoff reduction method. And what that method does is compare pre versus post conditions. So if you have a site that is forest open space, which is pretty much anything that's undisturbed in its natural state, it releases less phosphorus into the runoff as opposed to a post development parking lot. So this method calculates what that difference is and how much needs to be reduced on site through a best management practice. So is the source of the phosphorus almost exclusively fertilizer that's being put on or is some of it natural? Some of it's natural. Um, it phosphorus, like we had said, binds to sediment. So with the erosion, it's in the soil. Right. Um, it comes from vegetation. A lot of things that appear to be natural can actually have pollutants that impact our downstream waters. Are you familiar with the fertilizer called mill organite? Okay, I don't think it has phosphorus. Yeah. Uh, M-I-L-O-R-G-A-N-I-T-E. It's from Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. We'll look that one up. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the next, next aspect, uh, sorry, aspect of technical criteria is water quantity. So this is how much and how fast uh, the runoff is occurring. Um, the first part of water quantity is what we call channel protection. And it really focuses on those smaller, more frequent storm events um, that tend to cause erosion in our downstream channels, regardless of if they're man-made, like a concrete flume or swale, restored or natural. So the intent of channel protection regulations is to um, use what we call the energy balance equation to mimic pre-development flows, the amount of water that hits the stream and how quickly. The next part of water quantity is what we call flood protection. So these are those bigger, um, less frequent storm events. And what we're looking for here is that the downstream system has sufficient capacity. So this goes back to the more traditional pre-2014 stormwater regs that we discussed. Um, and you can see uh, the photo on the right is the underground detention at the north side property yard. And that's really designed to hold that flood protection that we're concerned about, hold that excess water and release it slowly so it doesn't flood downstream. So with flood protection, we're really just looking to bring uh, post-development flows back to pre-development rates. Okay, and I think um, Ed Summers has a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So. I'm confused on this one. Um, is there a size where this kicks in? Can you go? I knew you explained that earlier, but the flood protection requirement. So all sites need to be reviewed for both channel and flood protection. The flood protection, the calculations that we uh, use to ensure a site needs flood protection involve those larger storm events, what we call the 10 year storm, um, which has a probability of occurring once every 10 years. Um, so we use those um, types of storms, those larger storms for checking conveyance and capacity. Um, but we also, under these new stormwater regs, do that channel protection on the previous slide for those smaller storms, those what we call one year storms, which are, have a probability of occurring um, every year annually. It's my fault. I don't think I asked my question well. Um, I, I guess my question is, if I build a single house, am I required to make sure that post-development flow rate be less than pre-development uh, flow rate in a flood protection criteria for a single house construction? 
Yes, um, any disturbance over 2,500 square feet needs to meet all of these requirements. And how, do, how does somebody who built a single house, with, let's assume that you had forest land there, nothing, trees, grass, whatever, how do they, for a flood event, prove that they're gonna, how is that even possible to, now you put up, you've, you've obviously, the house itself is in, impermeable, so, I don't understand how you show that you're going to have from a flood rate less flow than pre-development for a single house development. Sure. So um, the pre-development for most of the single houses have a good percentage of impervious cover already. We're not taking it back to natural conditions unless the site is already um, not developed. So the difference that you have to make up is um, already a little bit less because typically there is an existing house or existing impervious surface on site. The rest of it is made up through a lot of those small um, best management practices. For example, um, the infiltration trenches, which are those depressions that you occasionally see in front yards, will take the quantity of water um, and then use the soil infiltration rate to show how much of that water is actually going into the ground as opposed to running off. Um, some single family houses choose to install um, you know, pipes underneath um, uh, to hold the water, which this uh, north side example is like a, a very large scale version of what's getting installed on single family houses. Thank you very much. So, so Ed, realistically, any new single family house in Vienna has a stormwater management system because um, it's almost always larger than the house it's replacing. So you can't build a larger house under the law, and this is relatively new. This only kicked in in 2014. You cannot do that anymore um, unless you match the, the water flow pre-existing. So almost every house in Vienna now has some form of stormwater management systems or multiple systems in order to, to meet those requirements. Thank you, but in addition, I'm seeing the word less than so you have to do better than was previous you can't just match you've got to do better or am i wrong so for flood protection i believe it is at or below but i can check the exact wording on that typically the map when it comes out it's typically below um, the way the numbers work out it's usually close but below um, and then for channel protection there's actually an improvement factor that says you have to actually make it better than it was in pre-development conditions. Thank so it's you. usually about, yep, no problem. Super helpful, thank you. Okay, thanks, keep going. Oh, Steve Potter. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, this, uh, this may be a, a question to uh, the town attorney or maybe uh, Mike Gallagher. What happens uh, if, to a neighbor who has a new house built next to it and it's very obvious that the the flow is not the same as it was before what recourse is there for that citizen who now is getting uh runoff unlike uh existed previously um well generally we'll we'll try to figure out if um you know if that house is still under under a permit, then we have some leverage to go and, um, you know, sort of talk with the developer and understand what's going on and try to mitigate. Um, and sometimes though it's, you know, I guess the, you know, the, the I don't know if it's a legal word, but it's like the water is a common enemy. Um, it's kind of, um, there's not much there's not much that can happen if you know water's coming from one site to another, particularly past when a permit's been released. Um, there's really little the town can get involved with. Even, even though it can be shown that the flow does not equal the 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 the, the post does not equal the pre. Well, that would have to be. Madam Mayor, maybe I can jump in. I mean, I, I, sure. think, I, I think what it should not be greater than pre-development. What it may be is different. 
And we've seen if that situation because the grading changes and, mm -hmm. you know, so it is a three dimensional development. So they, they, they're looking at not only, <clears throat> you know, when they're grading it, grading it flat, they're not grading it flat. They have to grade the property to, to drain a certain way. And a lot of our older exist our older existing subdivisions, either the grading was not done properly or it's been modified over the years. You know, homeowners change their their sites. They, they bring in fill or they dig holes and put swales in. Um, and so when the new development comes in, it's to the modern standard. And it, you're usually talking about sheet flow changing from one direction to another. And we've had that uh, because it's flowing in the wrong direction and it can't get to the uh, inlets that it has to to, to go to get into the stormwater system for the town. So it, when it's designed by the engineers, they may change the way the sheet flow is going. A, a, a property owner is not allowed to channel property to another person's property to create a nuisance. And in theory, when they're doing these grading plans that Mike and, and his staff review, they're supposed to be checking for those. And there's been times where, you know, because you're not looking at a bigger plat, so you're not seeing how it interrelates with the other lots. And, you know, they check them. And we've had situations where we're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're creating a problem by the way this is, the it's sheet flowing and collecting to, to get to, you know, downhill, water can only run way, run one way, but it's, it's going through somebody's yard in a way to create a problem. And so they'll redesign it on the fly. And that's what they, you know, sometimes you have to do that. That's the problem with doing these one-offs. And the Vienna, Vienna has struggled a lot with that single lot de development is way harder to do integrated stormwater management than when you're doing a 50, 100, 200 lot subdivision. So when you've got all the sections of Jonas, for example, you know, they, they weren't all developed at once. A lot of people don't realize that. A lot of individual sections, some as small as, you know, five houses at a time and then bigger lots. But, you know, they didn't have a lot of integrated stormwater management back then. They did put in storm pipes, but the way the grading was very different than how we would do it now. So in a nutshell, that's, you know, how we're doing it, but you, they should not be channeling to make a, you know, a, a channel to somebody's yard and then there's an outflow. It's supposed to be sheet flow. Uh, and, and that's the short answer for that. Okay. Thank All you. Right, thanks, Steve. And, and I could just add from personal experience, since I've had development all around me, every single property has been redeveloped around me since I moved in. There's a huge difference between the 20, pre-2014 development and the post-2014 development. Um, we built our house in 1997, and not longer after that, there was um, uphill redevelopment, and all of a sudden, our basement started flooding because they directed a lot of water down the hill, which was legal at the time. Mm -hmm. I've had two, three other properties redeveloped in my neighborhood since then, post 2014, and I've had no problems. And that's because they've put in effective stormwater management systems in those new properties in order to meet the requirements. So it's still an issue. And there, I'm sure there are times when the engineers don't get it right, or you have unintended consequences, but it's, it's far better than it used to be. That's good to know. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then to clarify, I did check. It is less than, not less than or equal to. So that slide is correct with the terminology. So that leads us to the stormwater solutions of how do we address, how do we meet this technical criteria and address the problems that we're having? Um, the first way is to keep the impervious surface below the pre-development conditions, but that is not um, very practical all the time. So we end up installing best management practices that we have been discussing, um, those BMPs. Um, an additional option for water quality only is to purchase nutrient credits. That does not um, achieve water quantity, channel or flood requirements. So here are some photos um, of common BMPs that we see around town. Um, on the left is an example of a type of bioretention. It's not your typical rain garden, but it's a tree box, and you'll see them connected to um, a lot of the newer homes. The center photo is the infiltration trench that we discussed, which often looks like um, a depression in a yard. Sometimes they're filled with the, um, the river rock, and they usually have those white caps on them that are actually observation wells. So you can open those up after a rain event 
and measure the amount of water to make sure it is indeed infiltrating correctly. Hmm. Is, I don't know, she asked, what you put in the parking lot back there, is that an infiltration tr trench? That's um, a rain garden. So that's a type of bioretention. Okay, all right, sorry, okay. Yeah, no, it's a good example. Yeah, that's a great example, thank you. Um, and then the pervious pavement example in the community center at the right. Right, right, and that's, that's all the spaces. It's all the, the parking spaces, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, Ed. The, the pavement, I, I couldn't wait to get to this slide. This is so helpful. <laughs> the lifespan of the permeable versus impermeable pavement. Can you talk a little bit about like, what is, is there in a, like, does it cost more over 10 years? Does it last longer? Just in general, can you speak to that? Sure, so my general understanding is that because the stormwater management permeable pavement um, does consist of more of a system. It's not just pavers. It tends to be a little bit more complicated to build. There are more materials in it. You have to do um, gravel below it. Sometimes they have under drains. Um, for example, the community center has under drains. So it tends to be more extensive. Um, and they also have to be um, situated on the right types of soils. They are, they are very complicated BMPs. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not frequently as frequently used as some of the other tree boxes that you see. Um, but, lifespan, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, yeah, and that lifespan, go ahead. Um, I would imagine the lifespans are pretty consistent. The benefit of a stormwater management BMP is that it has to be inspected every five years and it has to um, be maintained through a stormwater management agreement that anybody um, with a, a BMP on their single family residence has signed. Um, and that gives, and that's required per, so the town for the state is required to enforce the maintenance and inspection of these facilities. And that's our mechanism for doing that. Thank you. So at our current rate of redevelopment, are we creating a long-term um, expense for the town? Because more and more of these um, privately owned systems are going in and do we require they be the privately owned ones be inspected every five years? So the state requires that we enforce that they are inspected every five years. The benefit okay. is the homeowners were able um, we're able to defer that to homeowners using um, li hiring licensed professionals in the state of Virginia. So the state says that the homeowners can go out and hire a licensed engineer, or architect, or land surveyor. So we don't have to do it. That's, that's correct. We track it to make sure we're responsible for tracking to make I sure see. it is accomplished, but they are responsible for doing that because it's a privately owned facility. And the people who buy the homes in Vienna know that when they buy? So, uh, I would think so. How many, yeah, how many private? Because I know, um, I think an example, of course, is next door to us, the townhomes next door. They they have one of those B, BMPs or whatever, and they have to get get it um, inspected every five years. How many How many homes, like Chuck's saying, would you say have this system that they have to pay for and get inspected every five years? So the majority of new homes post-2014 have these facilities. Really? Yeah. Almost I, I, yeah. Yeah. If you all look, if you know what to look yeah. for, they're, they're and there. And they all have to get. You, you see the white pipes. That's yep. one. Yep, right. Okay. Not many people realize they have them. So what about pre-2014? What about pre because there are sites that have stormwater. Are they inspected by the homeowners or are they inspected by the town? So the pre-2014 sites are mixed. It wasn't as organized as it was post-2014. So some of the site plans specify that they are privately maintained and some of them specify that they are publicly maintained. So those need to be, if they're publicly maintained, they need to be inspected annually. If they're pre-2014, so no maintenance agreement and they're privately maintained, they need to be inspected every three years, I believe. Okay, Howard. So yeah, using what Linda said next door, the system next door, the town has no financial responsibility to maintain it. The homeowners has. Yes, it's a private we had We've had people that are a little upset that didn't realize that. But but so getting back to what Chuck said, if you put a system in and it passes an inspection, the town does not bear financial responsibility. It's the, the owner does. That's correct. Okay. 
I think, quite honestly, as, as the years go on, if we're still around, and of us, I think we're going to get more and more people getting upset with us because they didn't come in and discover, I didn't realize I had this expense. Well, are other jurisdictions doing it too? I mean, it's it's a state. Is it a state? Did you say that was a state regulation? No, that one. It's, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no. Um, it's within the Chesapeake Bay, so a right. majority of the Chesapeake Bay jurisdictions have similar rules. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else before we move on? Okay. Oh, Chuck, go ahead. So, I have one big question, which is. My recollection when I last looked at this, which was many years ago, is that the Chesapeake Preservation Act did require over time reductions in phosphorus runoff and all the rest. And when the Supreme Court essentially told the states that we were not complying with the law, essentially the responsibility for getting those reductions got kicked back to the local um, jurisdictions. Are we, um, do we have any long-term financial exposure in terms of how we deal with this long-term? That is, are we able to manage these laws mainly through enforcement in redevelopment, that's how we're dealing with it, as opposed to ourselves being required to build major stormwater management facilities. I mean, so far, I think we've really relied on redevelopment to sort of get us where we need to be. But is that a is that a is that a viable way of doing this over the long term, or should we be planning for major expenses in the future for stormwater management to meet Chesapeake Bay requirements? So the town has the Chesapeake Bay Action Plan, which outlines how we need to, what we need to do to meet these phosphorus and other pollutant reductions. Um, a portion of those um, are the single family homes and the phosphorus that's removed from uh, these BMPs. But that's only a small portion. The town does the stream restorations, um, street sweeping um, and shared projects with Fairfax County that we plan into the capital improvement uh, plan to be able to meet our Chesapeake Bay um, action plan. So there are other projects that need to be implemented right. that we have long-term plan to meet those Chesapeake Bay goals. But they're in the budget now, it sounds like. Uh, yes, yeah. So the stream restorations are a big one. We receive a lot of credit. Right. And then additionally, we have a um, memorandum of understanding with Fairfax County um, where we do shared credits with them. So we get a portion of the Chesapeake Bay credit that is reduced within the county because of our relationship and because of our, um, the citizens pay county stormwater tax. So it's more of a joint effort for us with the county for those Ches Bay requirements. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is I just remember there being a huge panic when this um, court case came down as to, yeah. oh my gosh, this is going to cost us a fortune mm -hmm. over the long run. And it seems like we've been able to manage that, um, which is good news. <laughs> and we, we are on track to continue meeting our Chesapeake Bay goals. Um, That's yeah. what I like to hear. Yeah. So it's a five-year permit cycle, and we're two or three years into it now. So every five years, we have a new... Um, percentage that we need to meet. So we um, are continually working towards that with support of the county as well. Okay, thanks. Um, and Mercury, didn't we, we always had um, David Bulova come in and give us an update on, right? What, is that happening? And, and who's the new person? I know that he's moved on. Yes, I'm Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, Dave Bulova, although he is in the General Assembly, I think he comes here from time to time um, as part of his private um, work. Um, and I think there's a part of a consultant team or something mm -hmm. that gives guidance with the MS4 uh, permit and such. And I think Christine could probably speak more directly to that. So um, David Bulova is part of our um, on-call environmental uh, service professionals that help us prepare our annual municipal separate storm sewer permit or MS4. 
And as part of that permit, we do a presentation to council every permit cycle. Um, so we'll be doing that, you know, every five years. I believe the last oh, one was every five years. Was oh, okay. Two or three years ago. Oh, so, okay. okay. Um, I don't know how often. To... I felt like I'd seen him several yeah. times, but I didn't remember. And another question is, aren't are some of the um those credits, can, do you get some of those offsite as well or not? I thought I, I we had a discussion about that. Yes, yeah, so you can, homeowners can purchase, um, they're called nutrient credits um, mm -hmm. from nutrient banks, which are offsite improvements that, you know, a, a nutrient bank may build a, build a wetland and receive quality credit. And then as long as it's within the appropriate watershed, um, you can purchase those nutrient credits. Um, but that does not uh, help a land disturbing activity comply with water quantity. Right. So right. a lot so, of times it makes sense for them to do a best management practice, which addresses quantity and quality instead of just buying quality credits. Yeah. And it probably usually does. It's kind of that way you're saying once they do their whole water quantity, then it's that's usually what, takes care that's of That's what it. I tend to see, but yeah. sometimes it, it goes up and down with what mm. the developers, how they prefer to meet these regulations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, um, Ed. I'll, I'll be real quick. This this relates this this question I have first came to my mind when we were discussing lot coverage rules, and it relates to this issue now of stormwater. Our realtors, we have a lot of people that move into our town either from out of state or a different part of the state or somewhere else. Are realtors required to tell a homeowner? A, your lot coverage level, or B, you've got this stormwater system that you're going to be required to maintain, get inspected, and so on. I think that's a question. I think Steve Brillia, correct? Madam Mayor, no. And, and the town years ago went to the General Assembly asking for requirements that developers, I'm sorry, uh, anybody selling a property had to disclose certain features. And the real estate folks, fought it uh, vociferously and, and it failed. Um, we wanted additional disclosures, including stormwater management easements and those types of facilities to be not to sh be shown on the plat. Because a lot of times when people go to settlement, they get what's called a meets and bounds, just the four corners and the location of the property. And they may not even get a plat survey that shows where existing easements are. They really should, uh, but they're not technically required. Most surveyors will put an easement on there. But some of these stormwater management facilities, especially the infiltration trenches, are routinely not shown in these little survey plats when people go to closing. So you say, well, how would they ever know? Well, it's, it's on their original building permit plat. Uh, it's also on a, on, a, on a subdivision plat. If it's a larger, you know, even a two lot subdivision would be on that plat. So, but people don't know to go check those records and they don't ask to see them at the closing. So currently we have no authority to require those disclosures under the real estate settlement provisions of the state code. We, we asked for it and maybe we should ask for it again. It's been a little while and we've had some updates, but it, it's, it's, it is an issue because it's, you know, and some people say it's buyer beware, but you know, I, I, uh, I don't know. I, it, it's, it's, it's in their land records already. That's what's frustrating to me. You're not, you're just asking the surveyors to pull things that are off the recorded records. Yeah, I think it's I think it's terrible, terrible policy not to have a transparency. I'm not saying whether or not it, things should change, but unbelievable that we can't somehow make sure that the home that we make it easier for homeowners to know what they bought on major issues like this. But I, thank you for the explanation. It it frustrates me, but I appreciate the explanation very much. Well, and and I, I'm I'm not trying to make your meeting longer, but maybe a solution is in the future. We can put our permit, our plans online for every property and, and everybody's going, oh my God, the, the IT folks are doing, but you know, we have these items. We're all getting them electronic now. The last, I don't know how many years all the plans are electronic, but you know, it's, it's you know, as soon as you have everything electronic, it, it, you know, it, it gets greater back in time. Um, but you know, we have a lot of the documents and all the documents are submitted electronically now. So we could put a database where if you wanted to access your original building permits, you could do it. And yeah, that doesn't, I go to buy a home. I'm not gonna call the town of Vienna to find out these kinds of things. You, you, uh, the practical answer is you deal with the homeowner and you deal with the real estate agent and that's it. And maybe you deal, and obviously you deal with your mortgage company, but 
anyway, uh, thank you for the explanation. I find it unbelievably frustrating, but it, it's a great explanation and thank you. Well, and it's, it's a big deal too, because um, at a hundred plus houses a year being redeveloped with the majority having stormwater management systems and those houses will be sold at some point. I mean, it's a big deal looking forward that people don't know that they have these obligations and that's something that maybe Steve, we really do wanna think about getting back on the legislative list. Yeah, no, that's that's true. Okay, uh, C. Potter. Uh, wh what are we looking at for, a co just for curiosity's sake, for the cost of one of these five-year inspections? Um, I don't. I don't necessarily because the homeowners hire the engineers. I don't necessarily have a quote offhand on that. Um, I would imagine less than a thousand around there, a yeah, couple hundred. I'm not sure. I haven't seen a necessarily a quote on that since mm -hmm. we don't hire them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Continue, please. Thanks. So we've actually discussed most of the things on this slide, um, the long-term maintenance agreements, as well as the uh, inspection every five years that's required. Um, but the table on the right shows the 15, I know it's very small, but I can explain it, the 15 <laughs> approved BMPs that the state says we're allowed to use to meet uh, the stormwater management requirements. And the point of this is to show that each of these BMPs has very specific design specifications as well as efficiency rates. Okay. So uh, lastly, I always like to kind of end stormwater presentations saying that um, while the impact of stormwater often feels very local, our uh, influence actually goes well beyond that of Vienna. So here's an example of the swale that runs under Glendon Street and how it actually runs to Piney Branch, which flows to the Potomac River and ultimately the Chesapeake Bay. Wow. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Ray. Very well done. How long have you been with the town of Vienna? Um, about four years. Four years? Yes. You're going to be here another four? I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Do what you need to do. <laughs> That's right. Christine loves her job too. I know. If if any of you haven't if you haven't been down to the um, property yard to see the the improvements down there, she's she's an excellent. Um, <laughs> she she really explains it well, and I know you're so proud of it. You've done a great job down there. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I have a, a niche passion for stormwater management. Yes, you and do. Restoration, it's apparent. So. <laughs> yes, definitely. Now that I'm retired, my wife and I are doing some walking. If you walk along the bicycle trail from the caboose down, because I walk my doorway, you get a full picture of what you did. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite something. Yeah. Now, the, the trees need to grow up, the, the grass and the grass, but you know, going from the bridge, it looks like several hundred feet, but it's several thousand feet. So it's, 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 it's just very impressive to see. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to bring up something since we're coming into budget time too. Um, you know, there are you and you guys can tell me how many. I think we we talked about this. I talked to um, Christine and Mike about this uh, before, so they're not going to be surprised I bring this up. But um, we have you know places in town that have. I mean, I know we have a lot of springs in town. Most people have some kind of water issues, but there seems to be certain neighborhoods that just have. I mean, crazy water um, issues. I, I know like over on Valley Drive, um, you know, it hasn't rained in days and I walk over there and there's there's water just pouring out into the street. And, um, and we had a discussion about like, how do you fix that? And some of the uh, residents were so frustrated and, 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 but so nice about it. Like they, oh, we'll even pay money. We'll help pay the town to, to fix it. And something that um, that Mike and Christine and I talked about that you all told me is that it would be something that we would have to do like under the road, like a huge project, correct? So w one thing I would love to see, I think what would be neat, and you guys can comment if it's possible and if, if we could do this, is start putting away money, have a fund in our CIP and put this in our um, budget and and start funding some of these things. I mean, they're huge. I know they cost a lot of money. So it's not like we can just say, oh, let's go do this here. You know, it's something that's going to take some long-term 
planning. But I think all of us as council members have heard or in our own backyards, you know, people who have very serious um, water issues that they can't just fix um, with, with one of these stormwater management systems. Can you, can you comment on that, Mike? Sure. So a lot of the, the problem stems from way back when in the 50s or 60s when those subdivisions were built, stormwater, not only stormwater management didn't exist, but stormwater design really is very minimal. And a lot of those subdivisions, you'll notice, you'll you hardly see any storm inlets along the road, just at the intersections. And nothing collecting water in the backyards either. And if you were to look at a storm, like a, a subdivision like Eunice Woods today, if that was all designed, there would be impressive amounts of stormwater infrastructure that would be designed in the backyards, in the streets. And um, so that's the challenge is that all this water runs off the surface down the street and, um, you know, so it, it would it would require a very large infrastructure design and implementation, including requiring easements from the properties, um, uh, you know, tearing up the road. It's, it's kind of, when I first came here to town, one of the first projects I worked on was the Lewis Street project. Um, that was just more, that was more than just a road improvement project and adding sidewalks that had you know, substantial drainage infrastructure that went into backyards. We got easements, um, you know, there's huge storm pipes under the road through there. So, um, but have, and the kind have of have improved the, the drainage there tremendously, right? I mean, Correct. It's really, yes. And how many, how many of these, like, how many do you, can you kind of think in town do we have that, that are just outstanding, you know, above normal water issues that would be, yeah. A lot of the southwest quadrant here has, mm -hmm. has, has minimal storm uh, infrastructure. And even like when we talked about Valley Drive, I think it's Valley Drive, they have a lot of new homes there. Mm -hmm. And even some of the new homes have these stormwater management systems and aren't able to, to you know, to yeah, help. The, I mean, so there are some places that even with new houses have issues. Yeah, right? and I think when you're seeing in dry days, a lot of water going down the roads, that's from groundwater either right. coming up or being pumped out through sump pumps from right. basements. Yeah. So anyway, it's just something. I thought I would mention it now. I thought this is appropriate time to mention it for everybody to think about um, since we also have uh, you know budget coming up and, and CIP and just thinking toward the future to help, help our neighbors. Misha. Um, so Christine, I just had a quick question. We started requiring stormwater management systems on new construction when they exceed 2,500 square feet of disturbance. In 2017, was it? Is that right? 2014. So, so we, we started requiring it in 2014. Uh, yes, that's when the regulations went into effect. So plans that came in in 2014 started to be reviewed for the new stormwater reg uh, regulations. And I believe it was in July of 2014 is when those uh, stormwater rules came into effect from the state but, level. Okay, so we can assume that any construction that occurred or new construction that occurred prior to 2014 didn't require these stormwater management systems. Is that correct? The, the stormwater the stormwater um, requirements were, you know, different before 2014. Yes, so they typically don't have these smaller systems on each site. So something for council to keep in mind is when we're doing the zoning rewrite, um, and this is one of the things that I had in mind when I um, proposed that we have to update stormwater management if we allow for um, increase uh, use of your lot for outdoor living space. Is that it is a way to get those houses, some of the newer houses that were built prior to 2014 to, uh, to get a stormwater management system on their property because right now they're not required. But if they wanted to add a porch, say for example, and it was an additional 3% of their lot, 
then they would not only have to put in a storm water management, um, and, and I could be wrong, but this is how I interpreted it, that they would not only have to put in a stormwater management system to cover that additional 3%, but for the entire, um, for the entire property. And so, or at least when I looked into it a couple years ago, this is what I um, think that I figured out is, or, or assumed I should say, is that if you have, let's say you have a house that's 5,000 square feet, and you're totally um, at your 25% lot coverage, and you did not put a stormwater management system into your um, property because it was prior to 2014. Then you add a patio that is 200 square feet, let's just say. I, I'm, I don't know what 3% is exactly, so I'm, I'm assuming 200 square feet should fit in that, that little model. But um, so now you, you, when you, in order to do that, if we do the zoning code update, correctly then, um, or you know, in a way to encourage stormwater management, then you would not only as a homeowner have to put, have to, um, put in stormwater management to cover that 200 square foot patio, but for the entire 5,200 square feet. So that is, no. and, and that is something Christine that, is shaking your oh. Well, we Go haven't ahead. written, we haven't, Go we ahead, haven't made our modifications yet. So that's right. why. Yeah, so I'm not saying that that's what is happening, Christine. I'm just saying that that is something that we can um, try and achieve. If I could comment on that. Yes, um, go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> to add a 300, 200 square foot patio in order to have stormwater management requirements apply, you would have to disturb 2,500 square feet of land disturbance. So a 200 square foot patio would not trigger stormwater requirements based on our law. And based on our law now. It. Right, Mike, but, yeah. yeah. But the law so, is, is written by the state and um, I don't think that that criteria, we could check, but I don't know if the state would allow us to do that. Or at a minimum, we'd have to go to the General Assembly and ask for us to amend our law to, to reduce the land disturbance even further. Okay, so we couldn't look at what was there prior to their new construction and compare it to that. Because I think we Madam talked Mayor, about this a couple of years ago. Madam Mayor, I, I think, yes. let me look into it. I understand what Mike's saying. I, I don't know, he under, he's saying the state doesn't require the, 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 uh, the requirements of bringing your property up to the current code for stormwater management and quality management, which is the current 2014 standard. And unless you disturb more than 2,500. Well, what, what right. council member Dr. Patel is talking about is you're at your max now, Mike, Mike, what she's talking about is if you want to go over the max, it's basically, you've got to bring your property up to current stormwater management quality controls to go over the max lot coverage. So we may not need statutory authority on that. Um, because I think it would be uh, you, you're no worse off than you were before. This is voluntary, so it's it's not mandatory unless you want to go over your lot coverage. And in that situation, you got to go back and bring your, your property up to code, basically. Uh, uh, there might be a way of doing that. If, and, and, you know, I think we need to sit down and talk about it. And I'll look at the statute that talks about when we can require it or not to see if it would trigger that. But it's a little slightly different than what Mike's talking about, I think. Yeah, and so and when Mike, I'm sorry, not Mike, uh, Steve, when we wrote, when we sat down and we looked at the wording for the lot coverage proposal that we had discussed at the um, community conversation, I mean, the wording specifically says any new or existing structure that does not already have a stormwater management must be, uh, must put in a stormwater management that is up to current code. I think that's how we worded it. I have to go look at that again. Um, but I, I know I did this with you and Mike. <laughs> yeah, we did. And, and so. the question is, Mike's worried about the statutory authority to do sure. it. But I think the concept, I think we understand the concept. The, the thing is, is what Mike, you know, Mike's also pointing out implied is for a, for a 10 by 20, you know, improvement, are, are you going to want to spend three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 for the stormwater management facility on top of that? I don't know, but that's, that's, that's not our problem. Question. Well, you're right. That's a question for the <laughs> property owner. Exactly. If they're willing to do it, you know, it's, it's not for us to, to judge or determine. So. 
I would okay, love- and um, Chuck, go ahead, Chuck. I, this is actually a very critical question um, because one of the reasons we ask for this um, tutorial, which has, by the way, been fabulous, and I really thank you and Mike for spending the time with us to educate us on this, is that as we rewrite the code and we are considering increases in lot coverage, um, I mean, my position right now is pretty clear. I, I'm willing to entertain it, provided that we can control stormwater management. And under the state statute, as I understand it, you know, the state doesn't kick in until more than 2,500 square feet is disturbed. And if we're talking about 5% of 12,500 square foot, then you're talking 625 feet. So it's below that. So, um, you know, this is a critical question that we do need to sort of nail down. Do, if we have the authority, then I think we can, you know, there's a way forward on this, but we really need to pin down whether or not we have that authority. Yeah. Can I, Cindy, did you want to? Yeah, please do. But regardless of the authority, you can, as the town attorney was saying, if you want to provide a waiver for driveways to not count towards lot coverage, if the driveway meets the state's definition of a BMP for permeable, permeable pavement, you could do that. That's one way. And that doesn't. Correct. That's not the same as a as a patio, though, or a. Correct. But then, if you take the driveway out because you're putting in a BMP permeable pavement, in you now you've got more lot coverage. Patio, you you you're yeah. allowing more lot coverage. So you'd make them put in a new driveway if they want to build their patio. No, you could also require the same thing for uh, if they're at lot coverage. The same thing for a patio that it be permeable pavement system that meets the state's requirement for a VMP. Thank you. Right. Be like a trade out. Okay. Except do you really want to institute a procedure that requires all these variances? Something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> a lot to think about. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions or comments before we um, we let Christine and Mike get home safely tonight in the, <laughs> in the freezing rain or whatever's happening out there. Anybody else? Uh, Ray. I joined with what Chuck said. It's been excellent, just excellent. Uh, I wasn't sure what to expect. It's exceeded everything I expected and I'm so glad. But one quick question and that is, when you're talking about disturbing 2,500 feet, every house, on a 20,000 square foot lot would easily exceed it. I mean, so, I mean, unless you're just going to have a, a I just, yeah. everyone exceeds it. So it applies to almost all the homes. Mm -hmm. Well, it applies to a new home, but if you're just bumping out by 500 square feet because you're putting on a porch. Well, the thousand square foot homes that we have now, absolutely. But most of the homes that I drive around and see easily disturb 2,500 square feet. The new ones, yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good comments. Well, thank you so much, Christine. Thank you, Mike. You guys are awesome. We're so fortunate to have you and we all learned a lot tonight. So thanks a lot.